In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and enkindle in us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your Spirit, and we shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Amen. Hello again. My name is Eric Immel, and welcome back to the Jesuit Post, and live the questions a Holy Week retreat in the Ignatian tradition. Thank you for joining me today, and if you're joining for the first time, glad to have you. I will pose a question to help our experience today in just a moment, but first, let's take stock of what we did yesterday. The guiding question of our time together yesterday was a simple but important one. Where are you? We took some time yesterday to explore the many ways one might begin answering that question. And I want to remind you today, just as yesterday, that we begin this retreat right from where we are. Everything that you are in this moment, everything that you've done, that you remember, your friends, your family, your joys, and your sorrows, all of it is right here with you in this moment. And it's in this moment that we set ourselves to carry on. Where are you? In order to explore that question, we took some time yesterday to learn about St. Ignatius Loyola, and in particular, something he wrote which serves as the bedrock of the spiritual exercises, the first principle and foundation. The first principle and foundation points us toward the ultimate purpose of our lives, to praise, reverence, and serve God, and by doing so, to be with God forever. In order to take the first principle and foundation seriously, we have to both trust that Ignatius knew what he was talking about regarding our purpose, and also we have to ask ourselves bravely and boldly, do I believe that the goal of my life is to be with God forever? Some days for me, that is the easiest thing in the world to believe. Days when life is perfect, I'm at peace, I've had a good meal, I've prayed, I've enjoyed time with friends, stayed up late, and looked at the stars. On those days, I feel close to God and want to be with God always. Some days, though, it's the hardest thing in the world to believe that I am meant to be with God forever. Days when I feel small and alone, when nothing is going my way, when I'd rather be anywhere else than exactly where I am. On those days, I sometimes fail to remember what I'm here for, to be with God. The trick, as Ignatius so wisely unpacks in the first principle and foundation, is not to worry so much about what I, Eric, want for myself, but rather to find myself in line with what God wants for me, which is everything. And here's something wild. The first principle and foundation also points us toward what God wants. And I still can't believe this sometimes, that what God wants is to hold me close forever. Where are you? It is, as I mentioned yesterday, the very first question that God asks of humanity in the Garden of Eden. And it's a question that God continues asking us today. God is looking for us always. Like parents who look for their children, like a child who searches for their favorite toy, like we look for those things in our lives which make us feel complete and whole. God looks for us, and we look for God. Today, we continue our journey making the spiritual exercises, which brings us deeply into what Ignatius of Loyola calls the first week. The first of four weeks or movements, the first week of the exercises, is an invitation to recognize, to see, and to feel the boundless love and mercy that God has for us. A God who draws us ever closer and wants everything for us, who wants to love us in all the ways that we need and we want to be loved. So if I want God and God wants me, then being with God should be easy. It's like when my dad grills brats. Now, don't forget I'm from Wisconsin. I want a brat, and my dad wants me to have a brat, and so I get a brat. God wants me forever, and I want God forever. So, God and I, together forever. Shouldn't that be how it works? Yes, but there's this thing. Sin. 
Sin is a thing that gets in the way. It's a thing that we all do and that we will continue to do for the rest of our lives. We're all sinners. And in that part of our identity comes the part of ourselves that doubts our true purpose. The thing that we have been made for, to be in relationship with our loving God always. Now, to be clear, our sin doesn't disrupt the capacity for love and God and our mutual desire for one another. But sin does knock us off the pathway toward God. Sin is one obstacle we must address if our goal is to be with God forever. And so today then, I'm inviting you to consider your sinfulness. If that feels overwhelming to you, then just remember this. Pope Francis himself, when once asked who he really was, said, quote, I am a sinner, end quote. If Pope Francis can bravely name that truth as part of his identity, then surely we can try to do the same. We are all sinners, yet we are called, and we are loved endlessly by God. Navigating our own sinfulness is another key part in naming where we are and where we want to end up. When I was a kid in Green Bay, my brother and sister and I used to walk to school. Now, there is a long way to walk to school, 0.7 miles to be exact, which took us down our street, up a big hill, then up another big hill where we'd eventually find my school. But there was also a quicker way, a way that involved a series of shortcuts through some woods and backyards, a final cut through a cul-de-sac, and eventually to our school. As opposed to 0.7 miles, this way was 0.3 miles, and so that way became our way. But in the winter, there was a problem. Green Bay, as you might know, is a snowy place. One year, it snowed on Halloween and on Easter Sunday, and snow was always something we contended with. I shoveled a lot, and sometimes I did a snow day dance around the kitchen table when maybe, just maybe, we'd get a day off. More often than not, however, a big snow day just meant that we'd walk to school via shortcut in freshly fallen snow. And so the morning after a big snowfall, we would walk to school in a particular way. We would boot up and drag our feet through the snow creating a more or less cleared pathway that would make the following day's walking to school a little bit easier. Now, what did I call this particular way of walking to school in the snow? A trudge of freedom. You see, by taking the time to drag our feet through the snow one day, we'd make it easier on ourselves every day afterward until the snow fell again. And when it snowed again, we would trudge again, always facing the pathway before us, knowing that ultimately we wanted to make things better for ourselves and one another on our way. This exploration of our sinfulness is like that, a trudge toward freedom. So let's talk about this idea of trudge for just a bit. Considering our sinfulness can be a trudge because it isn't easy to face ourselves through the lens of the mistakes that we've made, or the ways that we can be that aren't helpful to our end of being with God forever. Our sins are things that we've done that we would rather forget, ways of doing and being that disrupt what God has in mind regarding how we are called to live and be with one another and with God. Our sin marks us. And as much as we try to forget our wrongdoings, they form some part of our identity. There's an image of sin that I'd like to invite us to hold as we move into this trudge, into this work. For a couple of years, I would attend a week-long stay-over camp in the summers. You know, cabins and s'mores, early morning polar plunges, campfires, mess hall songs, the whole bit. And a big part of the week was signing up for various activities, canoeing, challenge courses, drama, arts, crafts, and on and on. One summer, I signed up for nine sessions of archery over the course of three days. All I wanted to do was shoot arrows at a target all day long. I loved it, and especially the feeling of a great shot right to the center of the target. More often than not, though, I would miss that center, 
I'd miss the mark. That, I think, is a helpful image for sin. Missing the mark. I was certainly trying to hit the bullseye each and every time, but alas, something often got in the way. A gust of wind, bad aim, lack of focus, doubt that I could hit the center at all. We all want to do the right things, to hit the mark. We want to be good to each other. We want to be at peace with those around us. And we want to take care of ourselves. And let's be good to ourselves here. More often than not, we get it right. We do show love. We do offer kindness. We are humble and compassionate. But we also build in our lives patterns of being which aren't helpful to us and which put us at odds with one another. It is certainly a trudge through some deep stuff to name those patterns and seek another way. Here, I think, is a good time to name the question that I'm going to invite us to frame our second talk with and to frame our experience of sin. And it just so happens that this question is the second question that God asks humanity in sacred scripture. Just to set the scene again very quickly, let's remember that Adam and Eve eat fruit in the Garden of Eden that they are not supposed to eat. Curiosity gets the better of them, as well as a little help from a serpent, something outside themselves. And their sin is the result. After they realize what they've done, they hide. Where are you, God asks. And they say, well, God, we are hiding from you because we are naked. And God asks, who told you that you were naked? Who told you that? Remember the story, my friends. Who told them that? It wasn't God. It was the serpent. It was someone else. Who told you that? I think this is a good question to frame our exploration of the ways that we have missed the mark. And I think it's a good question to aid us in our trudge toward freedom. After all, sin is, in part, a movement away from what we believe is true, that we have been made good, that we are made in the image and likeness of God, that God loves us endlessly, and that God wants to be with us forever. Who told you that? Remember, in the Garden of Eden, it's the snake, the voice of that which draws us away from God. And here, then, we come to an essential element of the spiritual exercises. The reality is this, that there are two voices, or what Ignatius and many others in the Catholic tradition would call spirits, at work in our lives. These two spirits are given different names, the good spirit and the evil spirit, the angel of light and the angel of darkness, shoot, even God and the devil. However we might choose to personally identify these two spirits, we have to be cognizant of the fact that they both operate in our lives. One, the good spirit, bears the voice of God into our lives and reveals to us all of the magnificent things that we're capable of bringing into the world. The other, the evil spirit, does just the opposite of that. The evil spirit lures us into believing that we aren't good, that we are utterly broken, that we are burdensome to others. This is the spirit that draws us into sinfulness. This is the spirit that draws us into doubt, into disordered attachment, anything that takes us away from God, anything that aids in our missing the mark. This is not to say, however, that we are puppets in a play being acted out at the cosmic level. We always have the power to choose, to discern, to listen to one spirit over the other. The trick is learning how to identify them both, and in doing so, following the good spirit ever away from the ways that we miss. A key first step in knowing the ways that the good and evil spirit work in our lives is by knowing ourselves more deeply. Who am I? What do I want? How did I get to be the way that I am? Much of my professional background is in working at colleges, and in the course of that work, I had the opportunity to take and to invite students to take various assessments 
that try and show us who we are. Myers-Briggs, True Colors, Strengths Quest, all tools by which we are able to know more deeply about ourselves and what we are good at. These assessments have helped me recognize that I'm an extrovert, for example. Knowing that I'm an extrovert, that helps me. It sometimes happens, for example, that I'm in a class at Boston College and one of my lovely professors is offering a particularly long lecture. By my extroverted nature, while that lecture is going on, I will just get more and more tired. I wish I had the ability to listen at rapt attention to anything for an hour, but my attention fades, I start writing illegibly, and maybe, just maybe, my eyelids get a little heavy. Maybe I start resenting or wishing that I could be anywhere else. My extroversion, just being what it is, might be something that the evil spirit uses to drag me down a potentially sinful path. But once that lecture is over and we break into small groups, what was bordering on exhaustion becomes energizing because I get energy from interacting with other people. After just a few moments in a small group discussion, I am more myself. Who told me that I am that way? A personality test. But also my friends and my family, heck, anyone that meets me for three minutes. Tests aren't the only thing around us that tell us the things that we need to know about ourselves. As I said, our friends and family, our quiet moments of consoling prayer, our thoughtfulness about our real experience, and of course, our relationship with God, God who seeks to act in our lives through the Good Spirit. One evening, I was at Mass in my Jesuit community, and I was feeling pretty terribly about the day. Work had been hard, I was feeling inadequate, I'm sure you can relate. And then the homily started. A homily so beautifully simple and profound that I am telling you about it now. The preacher, Father Michael Caruso, invited each of us to take a quiet moment and consider what two things Jesus might say to us. And, like a gentle, loving friend, Jesus told me, Eric, I love you, and you are doing my will. Who told me that? Jesus. That is to say, God, and as such, my day turned around and I was able to rest in peace. The Good Spirit. But when does the trudge get hard? When the evil spirit gets after us? Here's how that can look for me. A Jesuit named Dick Bauman tells a very similar story, and I think it's illuminative. I took a symbolic logic class during my first year of studying philosophy at Loyola University Chicago. I had never seen anything resembling symbolic logic before, but early successes indicated that I'd be able to manage the material. And then I got my second test back. A 62% an F. Ugh. When I first saw that score, I thought to myself, well, I might not be so good at symbolic logic after all. Now, had I stopped naming that potentially true thing, I may have been able to more easily navigate my response. If I'm not that good at logic, I can get extra help, I can do more practice problems, I can stay the course. I am resilient and I can get through tough things. But I did not stop there. After thinking very humbly that I might not be a good logician, I thought, well, shoot, I'm probably gonna fail the next test. And then, if I fail the next test, every test after that, and then I'll fail the class. And then I'll probably fail all of my classes. And then I'll get kicked out of my philosophy program. And because Jesuits are smart, and by getting kicked out of my program, that must mean that I'm not smart, the Jesuits are gonna realize that I'm not smart and they're gonna kick me out of the Jesuits. I'll have to move back in with my parents. And oh my God, I'm going to die alone. Do you see how that works? <laughs> The evil spirit takes the simplest of things, a perhaps inconsequential thing, and puts a bug in my ear that things are far worse than they appear. And I spin. And to get out of that pattern, it is a real trudge. Taking the time to get a sense of how these two voices operate in our lives is essential when we explore our sinfulness because we operate in a world that is saturated by God's love. 
which means that God is trying to accompany us through each and every moment. But there's also something in the air that seeks to draw us away from God. By attending to ourselves, knowing more deeply who we are, and knowing who is telling us what about ourselves, we can navigate our shortcomings and seek that ultimate goal of being with God forever. The only way out of those kinds of confrontations with the evil spirit is to stop and ask ourselves, who told me that? You see, a confrontation with our sin is not an exercise necessarily of looking back on our lives and listing every single thing we can think of that we've done wrong. We would only overwhelm ourselves if we do that. We'd come up with 10,000 lies, 20,000 hateful thoughts, 100,000 tiny acts of negligence in our relationships, even remembering over and over again the very worst things that we've done. No, considering our sinfulness is about first recognizing those times and ways that we listen to someone other than God, and then in naming that operative voice, saying simply to ourselves, it doesn't have to be this way. I am made for more than doubt, more than idolatry, more than self-loathing, more than cutthroat competition with others, more than big and little transgressions to get ahead while others continue to suffer. I am made to be with God forever. That's what God wants. And God has given me everything that I need. For years, I've had an on-again, off-again relationship with tobacco, and particularly cigarettes. The origin of that relationship rests in high school and college friendships. Some of them smoked and I wanted to be included, so I'd also smoke on occasion. Not to blame them, I just wanted to fit in. And so I would choose to join in, unreflective about what it might cost me. At times, my cigarette smoking was a purely social enterprise, and at other times, it was a little bit more habitual. Every so often, I would take stock of what I really wanted in life, and I would choose to stop. But as Mark Twain famously quipped, the best part about quitting smoking is starting again. And so for years, on and on, the cycle went. I'd have one cigarette, the deep talons of addiction clawing into my life, and then I would buy a pack. I'd try to set limits, only smoking at the end of the day, and only one cigarette. But one might become two, and two might become five on a Saturday night, and my clothes would smell, and my mouth would feel dry, and I would say to myself, it doesn't have to be this way. As I explored my vocation to the Society of Jesus, I found a better habit of regular prayer. And one day, in the midst of one of these flirtations with tobacco, I prayed ardently, God, please, I want to quit. I never want to touch a cigarette again. I mean, I know, it's a terrible habit. Everything in me and the world around me says that smoking does nothing good for me, aside from a nice social opportunity and maybe a temporary relief from whatever anxiety had captured me in a particular moment. And so after making this ardent prayer, I listened. And in my own way, I heard this voice, Eric, quit smoking. And then deafening silence. So I prayed ardently again, God, please, please, please help me quit. Help me quit smoking. And God said again, quit smoking. Here's how I take this. First, I wanted to quit. Second, I had wanted to quit for a long time. Third, I had everything at my disposal to help me quit. Fourth, I had a God who was willing to speak right to me and tell me to quit. Who told me to quit? God. Who would tell me otherwise? Well, not God. Now, ask me if that was the moment that changed everything. The answer is no. Not at least if that was the moment I quit smoking and never again touched a cigarette. I still bumble along in this relationship. I've used other kinds of tobacco. I've dipped back into the habit on occasion, and believe me, I've navigated successful but painfully strong urges. But I have the witness of that voice, the voice of God, which comes to me through many channels, 
that always says the same thing. Quit. You can do it. I'm with you. I've given you what you need. I'll be here when you fall short. I'll be here when you succeed. And I'll be here as you bumble along at every point in between. This trudge toward freedom, you see, it starts with a recognition of the things we do that we would rather not do. A recognition that sometimes, through the influence of the evil spirit, we do what we don't want to do. I'd rather not miss the mark. I'd rather not get too hung up on wanting success over failure, health over sickness. I'd rather be indifferent to those things. I'd rather walk through the world utterly confident that all will be well and that I'm not ever suspended between utter joy and utter disaster. I'd rather not engage of patterns of self-loathing and self-denial. I'd rather remember what I really want and what God really wants, which is simply one another. A trudge toward freedom. So what about freedom? I think we're in an identity crisis regarding freedom, as we might understand it in this, our American culture, versus how we might understand freedom in the divine sense. So often, the freedom that we are taught to seek is the kind of freedom that says, I should be able to do whatever I want, whenever I want, no matter what it costs anybody else. We know that kind of freedom is a myth. We are always in relationship with others, and that means that whether we realize it or not, our lives, our actions, our motives, our efforts are influenced by others and have an impact on others. Freedom, in the Ignatian sense, is more about, and I get that this might sound a little funny, freedom in the Ignatian sense is more about surrender, and especially surrender toward the good. It's about remembering who tells me what about myself, the good spirit or the evil spirit, and leaning into that good. It's true, I have screwed up epically in my life, <laughs> but that's not really the core of who I am. The core of who I am is a God-conscious work in progress. A sinner, yes, but a sinner who is made for goodness. Surrendering to that reality is the pathway forward. Two final thoughts, and then some tips on how to pray with what I've offered here today. First, let's go back to that trudge of freedom. As a kid, I wasn't super attentive to the fact that in taking shortcuts to school, I was trespassing, quite literally trespassing on other people's property. So while the shortcut was great for us kids, it was possible that those people whose yards we passed through did not want us there. And so, unbeknownst to me, my mom was working behind the scenes, offering kindness to those whose yards we passed through. She would offer a bag of fresh tomatoes from her garden or a plate of brownies as a peace offering. She would give these folks a card at Christmas time, a humble request on our behalf to forgive our trespasses. She was always working behind the scenes to help clear the pathway toward our freedom. And while we kids did our part in facing the snow, my mom faced other parts of the journey for us to make our passage easier. This, I think, is a good image of God. A God who walks with us, who knows how good we are, and who wants to help clear the pathway toward divine love. The second thing, it's important to note that we might not always know what's best for us, and that God, as a companion, is a surer way on this path away from sin and toward freedom. I remember once, while making my own retreat, feeling a bit resentful toward my guide, Faced with an entire day of silence, he had mapped out my entire day for me. He told me when to wake up, when to pray, and which materials to use in that prayer. He told me how to eat my meals, what to read, when to exercise. He, and not I, determined every move I was supposed to make. That doesn't sound very much like freedom. But in my trust and in my knowledge that he wanted what was best for me, I did what he asked. As I meandered through the day that he had laid out, something interesting began happening. I felt more and more free. I felt safe. I felt like there was a plan. I felt like I didn't have to try and control everything because I put trust in the fact 
that I didn't need to be in control. And truly, it was the greatest freedom that I had ever known. I recognized that if I tried to solve all my own problems, that I would always fall short. Only by placing myself in the hands of something bigger than myself was I able to enjoy the deep closeness with God that I have always wanted. Today then, our question, who told you that? Take some time today, maybe 15 or 20 minutes, to really think about who you are, what your gifts and talents are, where you feel most alive, how you best engage the world such that the good is always at the center of how you live. Take some time today also to think about where you fall short, what you prioritize over and above God, where you doubt, where you feel trapped, what patterns you fall into that you would rather avoid. And in doing this, try to remember, we miss the mark sometimes, but we're not in a relationship with a God who gives us a limited number of chances. By listening to the Good Spirit, listening to what we know about ourselves, and knowing what we must be rooted in, God will actually reveal to us how much God loves us. And God will show us who we really are. When the voice of the evil spirit breaks in, by knowing the voice of that spirit, we have the capacity to say to it, not today. I'm not doing this today, and it doesn't have to be this way. I know that you, evil spirit, are telling me that I am not enough, but you are not God. And God saw and sees that it is good. We are good. Our sins are certainly a part of us, but they are not all that there is. The goal of our lives is to be with God forever, and when it comes to this confrontation with our sinfulness, forever starts right now. If you're looking for some scripture, I would suggest praying with Psalm 51. Other scripture verses that might be helpful are in the episode description, along with some questions for reflection. Use them as they are helpful to you, and I hope that you will join us again tomorrow. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen.